having Bible study either week because it's Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. Okay. okay. The prayer meeting was uh, for the watch night prayer that we normally do. We decided still to do it just at seven. All right. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to kill the lights up here? I can see off my computer, so it's not a problem. And good morning. Good morning. I'm trying to see who's still online. I saw Ken Hardesty on before earlier. I don't think he's still on. Uh, I want to tease him a little bit, but it looks like he he saved himself. Yeah, <laughs> he he knew better. But I, t I do see Jorge still on. I want to tease him. I'm, I'm surprised that being a Spanish speaker, he he still calls me Leo instead of Leal. You know, but that's okay. <laughs> I know. I, I needed to say it in English. Sorry, Alex. <laughs> no problem. I'm just teasing you. <laughs> I also heard Karen too. I want to say hi to Karen. Uh, hi. <laughs> good to see you. Let's uh, open up with a word of prayer and then we'll jump into our message this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, just uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, this time we have together, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that even in the midst of a pandemic, we still come together, whether we're at home or we're still gathered around the person of your son and around your word. And so, Father, we just pray that you would uh, mend, mend our hearts together, even though we might be apart from one another. We ask this in your son's precious name. Amen. Well then, so I want you this morning to imagine a ship at sea in the middle of a storm. All abroad are in a frenzy for their lives with the exception of one man who lays soundly asleep. Now, what Bible story am I talking about? Well, actually, there's two Bible stories that kind of fit the bill, isn't there, right? And in our study of uh, scripture, we want to um, compare events that are similar, compare and contrast them. Let's see if I can... Uh, Make this work. Oops, too far. And I click the wrong button now. Can you uh, go back one? Sorry. Just back one. Thank you. Oop, one. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so be a working process here. Uh, here's a table I put together, just a comparison of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and Jonah. Those are the two stories that fit that build, or that description, I should say. In the first case with Jonah, he was a prophet sent by the Lord. In the case of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was a prophet, but also the son sent by the father. Uh, Jonah was running from the will and the presence of the Lord, which if such a thing was possible. You know, we think of uh, Psalm 139, uh, verse 7. You know, where can I, where can I go from you? Where, you know, if, uh, if I were to go down to Hades, you're, you're there. Uh, David writes, uh, well, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was walking in the perfect will of the Father and was God incarnate and very much present in the flesh. You think about it. That's what Emmanuel means, uh, God with us. Very two different, uh, very two different these, these accounts are. Uh, Jonah was surrounded by strangers on this boat that was on the way to Tarshish. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was sur so surrounded by his loyal followers, with the exception of Judas, of course. Uh, the Lord sent a great wind, we read in Jonah 1.4, and that's what caused this storm on the seas. Um, in Mark 4, 37, we read that there arose a great storm of wind. And so the, both of these storms were caused by wind. And that's what uh, put these ships in peril as they were sailing. Um, in, the, in the case of Jonah, every man called unto their God, uh, to their gods. While in the account of the Lord Jesus Christ, with his disciples there on the Sea of Galilee, it was God who spoke. They weren't calling on gods, but it was God himself who spoke. Uh, Jonah was awakened by the captain. He was the maximum authority on that vessel. The captain of the ship came to Jonah and woke him up. In the case of the Lord Jesus Christ, his disciples went to the maximum authority, not only to the maximum authority on that boat, but to the maximum authority of the whole creation. He went to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they woke him up. Uh, those abroad, uh, uh, on board were exceedingly afraid when, they, when the lot fell on Jonah, and he told them his story. We read that in Jonah 1.10. We're also reading in like manner that the disciples were exceedingly afraid after he calmed the seas. And they asked, what manner of man is this? And they just saw something unnatural occur. They saw a man get up, rebuke the winds, and the storm cease. And they were greatly afraid by this. Read that in Mark 4, verse 41. In the case of Jonah, he had to leave the vessel for the, for the storm to stop. And the sailors had to throw him overboard for the storm to stop. In the case of the Lord Jesus Christ, all he had to do was to speak. All he had to do was speak, and the storm stopped. 
And so when we think of these two events that sound very similar as, we, as the way I presented them in the beginning, we can see that they're very different uh, when you come down to it. Though there are some similarities in, in both accounts. We saw that, for example, that the, it was a wind, great wind that, that provoked both these storms. Uh, but yet there were very different circumstances. As we mentioned, Jonah was fleeing from the will of, of, of God, but the Lord Jesus Christ was in the perfect will of God the Father. Let's see if this works. Just hit it once. There we go. Now, in our wandering from God uh, can often be attributed to a misunderstanding of his nature. Uh, we mentioned before that Jonah sought to run from the presence of an omnipotent, or, excuse me, an omnipresent God. And that's kind of a funny thing if you think about it, you know, uh, David in Psalm 139, he, he says, he writes those words, you know, and it's clear that there's no place you can run away from God. He's omnipresent. And Jonah, his misunderstanding of God's nature thinks, oh, I'll just go to Tarshish, you know, I'll get far away from, uh, from where God wants me to go. I just get away from, uh, from his will altogether. You know, there's no place that Jonah could have gone that God wasn't there. You know, oftentimes, you know, in, in our wandering from God, uh, we might, misunderstand his nature too. Sometimes we might doubt of his faithfulness, his goodness, his love towards us. And just like Jonah, we're misunderstanding God's nature. Um, Jonah thought that he could get away from an omnipresent God. And sometimes when things don't go right for us, you know, we might think, well, God's not being faithful to me. He, he's not keeping his word to uh, preserve me during difficult times. You know, he's not showing me his goodness or his love during this difficult time. We might misunderstand the nature of God, just like Jonah did. Now, despite Jonah misunderstanding uh, uh, God's omnipresence, he did understand, or he did have a knowledge of God's grace and forgiveness. And in fact, he writes, or he says so in verse 2 of chapter 4. He says, Our Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Now, Jonah knew that in his mind, but we're going to see that he didn't really understand that in his heart. And that's, that's a big, very big difference. You know, um, sometimes we know things about God, but we don't really believe them in our hearts. And I think that's something that's going to come uh, out in this study, that Jonah, he knew this, these characteristics about, about God. He knew that God was merciful. He knew that he was gracious. He knew that he was slow to anger. He knew that he was abundant in loving kindness. But yet he didn't really understand what the full extent of that meant. And I think sometimes we can fall into that trap too. We know a lot of things about God from our study of scripture, from our reading the Bible, you know, from the, the teaching of his word. But sometimes when we're put in those situations where, uh, you know, where the rubber hits the road, sometimes we don't understand the full extent of what that means. Though, even though we know it, we don't understand what it truly means. And we're gonna see that in the case of Jonah, maybe in our own lives too. So Jonah was called a prophet. We talked about that, one of the characteristics of, uh, and that in comparison we did that both the Lord Jesus Christ and Jonah were, were prophets. Uh, there is a prophecy of Jonah that's given to us in 2 Kings. It's almost an obscure and sometimes an overlooked passage, a verse in, uh, in 2 Kings. And I'm going to read it to you. This is during the time of uh, Jeroboam II. And we read in 2 Kings 14.25. He, Jeroboam II, restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of According to the word of the Lord, God of Israel, which he has spoken through his servant, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from gad Ephor. So this is the same Jonah. He's the son of Amittai. He's the prophet who's from, from gad Ephor. And so Jonah um, gave this prophecy to, uh, during the time of Jeroboam II, that the Lord would give them, give Israel the, from the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of Arabah. So that's one of the prophecy that's uh, recorded of Jonah in Second Kings. Ironically, though, um, this particular prophecy, though, it's not recorded in, in the Bible, the, the exact words. Um, verse 25 uh, pinpoints at least the time of uh, Jonah's ministry for us, which is important when we want to study his, this, the book that bears his name. And it's uh, kind of surprising to realize that the Assyrians who carried away Israel into captivity, um, only about 40 to, to 70 years passed after the repentance at Nineveh, uh, before they carried away Israel to captivity. Uh, that's what William McDonald points out in his uh, commentary. So between the time that Jonah went to visit them, about some 30, was it, uh, 40 to 70 years passed between that time, their repentance, the time that they, they took away Israel to captivity. 
Now going back to the prophecy that Jonah spoke, that's not recorded for us, but that's made reference there in um, Second Kings, we have another prophecy that's given to us by the prophet Amos. And Amos basically reverses what Jonah says. Uh, he, and, so, and, and you can understand why this happens, why God would do this. Uh, Israel had definitely gone far away, you know, between when Jonah spoke to the Ninevites to when this, uh, and when he gave the prophecy during the time of Jeroboam II, to when Amos comes on the scene. Uh, Israel had definitely strayed from the Lord. And the prophecy of Amos undoes what Jonah had promised the Israelites. Verse 13 and 14 of uh, Amos chapter 6. You who rejoice over Lodabar, who say, have we not taken Karnim for ourselves by our own strength? But behold, I will raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel, says the Lord God of hosts. And they will afflict you from the entrance of Hamath to the valley of Arabah. The very same two landmarks that uh, Jonah had given in his prophecy are given by Amos. And so what the Lord gives with one hand through the prophet Jonah, he takes away with the other hand through the prophet Amos. And this is all because of Israel's heart, how they had gone so far from the Lord that he says, you know what? What I had promised you before, I'm taking it back if you haven't kept your word to me. Now, as we look at Jonah and the Lord Jesus Christ in our comparison, we realize that uh, Jonah's life is intrinsically tied to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we read in uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 to 41. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it, except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ says about himself in Jonah. Now he ties his ministry to the, to the life of this prophet, Jonah. And he says to them, guess what? There's a greater than, than Jonah here right now. And during Jonah's time, when he preached to the Ninevites, this evil nation, they repented. And here I am, greater than Jonah, and you won't repent, O Israel. I'm one that's greater than Jonah, and I'm bringing you a message, and you won't repent. The Ninevites, they heard from Jonah, and they repented, but not you. Not you, Israel. You won't repent. Now, the context of, uh, of what the Lord says there is, is that the Pharisees came to him in verse 38, and they were asking for a sign. This is the scribes and the Pharisees that came to him. We read in verse 38, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And that's when the Lord relates his life to the to the or his ministry to the life of Jonah. Now, in the same chapter, we, we see that there is um, comparisons uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ and how not only is he greater than Jonah, but he's going to be greater than the temple and greater than Solomon. And we read those verses now. Matthew uh, chapter 12 and 6. Yet I say to you that in this place, there is one greater than the temple. Now, why did the Lord say this? Well, the Pharisees were upset that the disciples were plucking heads of grain on the Sabbath. And the Lord says to them, you know, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Had you known that, you would have not condemned the guiltless. You know, they were very upset because here are the disciples. They're plucking grains on the Sabbath. And the Lord says, you know what? There's one greater than the temple here. There's one greater than your place of worship here. And there's one greater here than your religion. And if you knew that I desire mercy and sacrifice, you would not condemn the guiltless. Going down a few verses in the same chapter, he's going to tell them that there's a greater than Solomon. It says, the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. But she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Sol Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. And so we take all these greater than and put them together. And we see how the Lord really is greater than. You know, he's greater than one of their prophets, the prophet that perhaps brought the uh, greatest revival in the Old Testament. I mean, who here wouldn't want to uh, see a whole city turned over, repent before the Lord? I mean, that'd be quite a, an evangelistic uh, outreach. You know, Billy Graham would preach to stadiums of people, and they would, you know, you have a lot of people make uh, you know, claims of faith, but a whole city? Who, who can preach to a whole city and have the whole city repent? Well, Jonah did, and yet the Lord Jesus Christ is greater than Jonah, greater than their prophets. He's greater than the temple, greater than their place of worship, greater than their religious institution. 
one greater than the temple is here. And he's greater than Solomon, greater, greater than their, the greatest king in history. Solomon was the king of peace. During Solomon's reign, uh, Israel enjoyed its greatest period, period of peace and prosperity. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ is greater than Solomon, greater than their prophets, greater than the place of worship, than the religious system, and greater than their greatest king. The Lord Jesus Christ is much greater than all of these. And it's good to remember that, especially as we do every Sunday morning when we gather around the emblems, that he's greater than, greater than anything that we can think of. There's one other reference in the Gospel of Matthew made to made about Jonah. We were in chapter 12. Now this is four chapters later in chapter 16. The Lord Jesus Christ makes another reference to himself in Jonah. He says, A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will, shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Before it was the it was the scribes and the Pharisees. Now it's the Pharisees and the Sadducees that came to him, testing him, asking for a sign. His response to them is hypocrites. You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the time. And he's saying to them, you know, you can see, look outside the sky, look at the weather, and you can tell, well, it's cloudy today. It's going to snow. It's going to rain. Uh, but you can't tell the signs of the time. You can actually tell what the weather's going to be like, but you have no idea the events that are going around you, the signs of the times. Had they known that, they would have realized that the one that was before them was the Messiah that they were expecting. Now, going back to the book of Jonah, there's many ways we can divide the book of Jonah. This is just one way I like to think of it. There's many different ways you can think about it. I like to break it into two different blocks. I like to tie chapter one and chapter three. And the theme there is repentant Gentiles. We're going to see in chapter one and chapter three that the ones who are going to get saved here are Gentiles. Well, chapter two and chapter four are linked by prayers of Jonah. Uh, chapter two is basically one, one large prayer. And chapter four, there's a prayer there that Jonah offers up. And he's kind of having a conversation with God as he's uh, upset about what's going to transpire there in Nineveh. And so let's uh, look at these different blocks. Let's go to the first block, the repentant Gentiles in chapter one and chapter three. And that's what links these two chapters. The Gentiles are going to come to faith as a result of the events that transpire in, in the book of Jonah. And Jonah chapter 1, verse 3, we read the following. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into it, to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Interestingly enough, Joppa in Scripture is primarily known for two things. It's known for bringing cedars from Lebanon. You're going to find that both David and Solomon arranged for cedars to be brought down uh, from Lebanon to the port of jo uh, Joppa, and then to Jerusalem. These cedars were both used to build God's house and the king's house. Uh, David used to build his own house, and, Sol and David made preparations for these uh, cedars to be brought down during uh, Solomon's reign so he could build the, the Lord of house. Uh, another thing that Joppa is known for is for Gentiles coming to faith. You're going to find that uh, not only in the book of Jonah, but also in the book of Acts. You read about Cornelius. Uh, you know, he he was told by the angel to go to the house of one Simon the Tanner and to ask for uh, uh, another Simon, Simon Peter by name, to, and to have his men bring him up with them. And so every time you see Joppa in Scripture, don't be surprised that you see Gentiles getting saved afterwards. So it's known for uh, the cedars of Lebanon and for Gentiles coming to faith. Interestingly enough, if you're to look at the flag of uh, Lebanon today, it's uh, made up of a uh, red stripe on top a white stripe in the middle, and another red stripe on the bottom. And it kind of looks like the flag of Peru. I know uh, Jorge, being from South America, would probably recognize the Peruvian flag. Um, with the exception that the Lebanese flag has a, a cedar tree in the center of it, right there in the, in the center portion of it. See, not only was Lebanon known for cedars in biblical times, but it's known for cedars today. Even their flag today bears, bears a, a cedar tree on it. The other thing that transpires in uh, Joppa that's uh, worth noting is that uh, there's the resurrection of Tabitha or Dorcas, as she called in scripture, as she, as, she, as she was known also, Tabitha or Dorcas. She was also resurrected there in Joppa. And that's going to relate to the two other things we mentioned uh, uh, before, the cedars from Lebanon and Gentiles coming to faith. You know, 
you think about Dorcas, she was dead. And there's only one cure for deadness, you know, life. If you're dead, the only thing that can fix your deadness is if you're giving you life. And that's exactly what happens to her. Uh, Peter, uh, uh, you know, everybody was mourning that she had that she had died and she was known for good works and charitable deeds. And then she had died and everybody was very upset about this. And Peter, uh, you know, he, he went there to her and he and she resurrected as a result. The Lord worked through Peter and she was resurrected. So she was getting new life. Now I mentioned that these two things, the cedars and the Gentiles come to faith are related. And the cedars from Lebanon also speak of Gentiles being saved. If you think about it, in, in a sense, these cedars from Lebanon also picture Gentiles coming to faith. Uh, the wood in scripture typifies humanity. You know, we, I often use the example of the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was made of two materials, wood and gold, right? And we know that the Ark of the Covenant is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And because it's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, it speaks of his two natures. The wood speaks of his humanity, and the gold speaks of his deity. You know, he was a, a, bi, a bipartite, uh, I guess is how you say it. He, had to, he was a, a being uh, that was a completely human, but yet he was completely God at the same time. And so because wood speaks of, uh, of uh, humanity, you know, think about the picture here. You have this uh, foreign wood from a foreign land being brought to Jerusalem and through the port of Joppa. And what's this wood going to be used for? It's going to be used to, be, to make the house of God. You know, this foreign wood that's coming from a foreign land being brought to Jerusalem via Joppa, and now it's going to form part of the house of God, the temple. Uh, Peter puts the same idea in New Testament language in the following way in 1 Peter 2.5. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So in the New Testament, we're called living stones that are being made part of the household of God. But in the Old Testament, the picture is that of, Le of uh, these cedars from Lebanon, this foreign wood from a foreign land, being brought to Jerusalem via Jobah to be made part of the house of God. And so I believe both the wood the fact that Gentiles get saved, usually when you read about Job and scripture, is a picture of uh, Gentiles being saved. Both of the same things, uh, both, of these, both, uh, both of these things speak of uh, Gentiles come to faith, being made part of the household of God. Now, Job and scripture means beautiful. Um, when Jonah stepped off the shores of uh, Jopa, running away from God, little did he know that those same rebellious feet would become beautiful when he stepped inside the city walls of Nineveh and brought a message of repentance. Isaiah 52, 7, we read, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. You know, then Paul takes the same words that Isaiah has spoken in his prophecy, and he requotes them and applies them to the gospel. And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. And so these feet that are that were rebellious when Jonah stepped off the, the shores of Joppa would become beautiful when they finally stepped inside the walls of Nineveh and brought a message of repentance. Interestingly enough, the uh, both verses, the original verse in Isaiah, speaks of, of uh, tidings of good things. Um, and Romans also... Uh, Paul says, who brings glad tidings of good things. You know, and that's what the word gospel means. Gospel means good news. And I want you to remember that, because when we get to uh, Jonah's actual message, you're going to find that it's anything but good news. You know, the goodness in his message is actually missing. And we'll, we'll see, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But just keep that in the back of your mind, that both of these verses refer to someone bringing good news, you know, the, the gospel message, basically. And that's a very different message that Jonah's going to bring. Now let's talk about the Gentiles that get saved. In the first part of the book, or the first uh, chapter, we have the mariners, these Gentiles who are going to be saved. In uh, verses, uh, verse 1 5, we read that the mariners were afraid. And we read that every man cried out to his God in the same verse. They were afraid, and as a result, they cried out to their own gods. And when they saw that it, that there was no answer from their gods, what did they do next? Well, they began to throw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea. 
they thought, well, if we lie in the ship, perhaps we can save ourselves. They're trying to save themselves by their own efforts. It's not going to work. Next, when that doesn't work, they first were afraid. They cast, you know, they cried out to their God. That didn't work. They, they lie in the ship. That didn't work. So they said, well, let's cast lots then. And so the lot fell on Jonah. And so they go and they question Jonah. You read in verse 1-8, please tell us for what cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And what people are you? So they want to know, you know, the lot fell on this man. Who is he? What's his job? What does he do for a living? You know, where, what country is he coming from? What people is he associated with that this lot fell on him? Jonah's answer comes in verse 9. He says, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who, by the way, made the sea and the dry land. That's all the mariners near to hear. Because they're in the midst of the sea, and all of a sudden they hear about the God of heaven, the one who made the very sea that they're in, and the one who made the dry land that there's so much longing for. Here they are in the middle of the sea that's raging, and all they, they can think about is the dry land. And all of a sudden Jonah says, you know what? I fear the Lord. I fear Jehovah, because that's really what he's saying. The God of heaven, the one who made the sea that you find yourself in, and the one who made the dry land that you're so longing for. And when the men heard this, in verse 10, we read that they were exceedingly afraid. Now, the men don't want to initially throw Jonah overboard. So nevertheless, they try to row harder to return to land. And once again, they're, they're trying to rely on their own efforts to save themselves. And finally, when they realize that none of these things have been working, you know, crying out to their gods, lying in the ship, you know, uh, even uh, rowing harder. None of these things were working. They finally cried out to the Lord. And he said, we pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. Do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. And so they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered sacrifices to the Lord and took vows. Read then 116. And I want you to notice in this chapter, there's a progression of fear. First, they're afraid because of the storm they're in. And then they hear about how Jonah fears the Lord, how he fears Jehovah. And when they hear this, about this God named Jehovah, how he's the God of heaven, how he's the God who made the sea and the dry land, and how this prophet fears him, guess what? They become exceedingly afraid. And then when the storm finally stops and they realize that this is true, that it's not just superstition, that this is truly is the guy who is in charge of all these things. Because how does throwing a man over a sea stop a storm? But yet that's what, exactly what happened. The men became exceedingly afraid. So they're afraid because of, of the, their situation they're in. Then they're afraid because they've realized who they're dealing with. And when they hear about Jonah's fear, their fear kind of matures. And now their fear is a reverential fear of the Lord. And that's why they made these sacrifices to the Lord and they took these vows. Because now they knew who the Lord was. And because of that, they repented of their ways and they offered these sacrifices and took vows to the Lord. And I would be surprised if those men, each one of them, you know, they left their gods. You know, those gods weren't able to save us. But this Lord Jehovah, he did save us. He did stop the storm. And they took vows saying, you know what, we won't believe in these other gods anymore. We're going to believe in the Lord Jehovah, the one who calmed the storms and saved us that day. We also read, too, that their, their cries were first to their gods, and then they cried out to the Lord, to the one and only God who was able to save them. And so these men, they progressed in their fear and also in their knowledge of the Lord. They went from crying out to their gods to crying out to the one and only true God, the Lord, the Lord God, the Lord Jehovah. Now, as these men are growing in their faith, Jonah is going down. As these men are growing in their understanding and in their knowledge of the Lord, we read that Jonah, he's constantly going down. We read in 1.3 that he went down to Joppa. He went down into the ship. And 1.5, he went down into the depths of the sea. And he laid down and fell in a deep sleep. Constantly going down, this prophet is. I'm not sure if this is going to show correctly. Oh, this should correctly. Good. I'm not sure the fonts are going to come, come across. 
And let's talk about chapter three. So we've gone from chapter one when we saw the uh, the mariners get saved. Now we're going to come to chapter three where we're going to see the city, the city of Nineveh come to faith in Jehovah or repent before Jehovah. Now, interestingly enough, you know, we talked about uh, the, the passage in Isaiah and also what um, Paul's quoting on that passage in Romans and how both of those accounts, they talk about the good news, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good tidings of glad things, you know, the gospel message, the good news. But ironically, uh, Jonah's message isn't anything but good news. In fact, in the original uh, Hebrew language, it's five words, five words. That's all it is. Is there any uh, Hebrew scholars in the audience or at home? Perfect. So I can mispronounce this and you guys won't know, won't know the wiser. So I'm about to butcher the, the, the Hebrew language. So bear with me as I do so. Um, here's what Jonah says. He says, Od abarim yom va ninevai havo. That's what he says. That's basically what he says in the original language. Five words. Now you'll count six up there. Or actually va, the vowel, becomes, it's a conjunction. It becomes part of the next word. I've actually been, I don't know if any of you uh, use uh, Duolingo. I was doing a little bit of Hebrew study in uh, in, in anticipation for a trip that, that was uh, put off because of the virus, I was going to go to Israel with Rob Sullivan. So I thought I'd try to learn a little Hebrew. And one of the things I learned from that that uh, application was that the vowel, the, which is our, similar to our an, uh, becomes part of the next words. For example, in, in Hebrew, you would say Abba, which means father. And if you want to say dad and mom, you would say uh, Abba ve'ima. And that's ma, dad and mom. But the ve becomes part of ima which is uh, mom. So it becomes, it becomes one word, which is interesting that uh, the vowel would do that. But yeah, it becomes part of the word uh, Nineveh. So it'd be v Nineveh, Nineveh. And so here, that's what he says. Od abarim yom va Nineveh hafak. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And I put in parentheses there, overturned. Because that's actually what winds up happening to the city of Nineveh. Now in these five words that Jonah pronounces, there is no good news. You have 40 days and none of us shall be overthrown. Is there any good news there? No. You know, I was in Chile many years ago and I was talking to a brother who, um, actually was the brother who baptized me down there. And then we we're talking about the gospel. And he said, you know, there's, he gave me a, a list of five things. We're talking about the gospel messages. He says, you know, there's, in the gospel message, he said to me, uh, he, there's five things a gospel message has to have. He gave me five, a list of five things. And the one that always stuck in, uh, sticks out in my mind is he says, a gospel message has to talk about the love of God. Is there any mention of God in this, in those five words? No. And yet alone of his love? No. There's no mention of God at all. Years, years later, I was also in Chile and a brother from uh, the city of Valparaiso where my father was born. Uh, you know, he was upset. He says, you know, brother, I've been listening to a lot of these gospel messages lately and, and they, they all lack the blood. You know, they, none of them mentioned the blood. And, and I suppose there's, there's uh, verses that support that. I mean, in Hebrews uh, chapter 9, we read about there's no remission of, blood, of sin without the sin of blood, right? So I understand the brother's case, but he was very upset because he felt that, that uh, more, more of these gospel, gospel messages should mention the blood because we're saved, you know, we're washed from our sins because of the blood. You know, whatever it is, whatever your list is, you're going to find that this message is lacking. You know, the message that Jonah brought it isn't good news. It isn't your typical gospel message. Right? It's only bad news. You have 40 days and the rest shall be overthrown. There is no good news in this. There is no, this is not, this is your atypical uh, gospel message. Uh, very similar to that. This is your atypical Christmas message. Uh, speaking of the prophet Jonah prior to Christmas. But, um, you know, this message, it's not what you would think would make people repent. It's only bad news. But yet, search the Old Testament. This is perhaps the greatest revival in the Old Testament that occurs. A whole city is turned over. And the words that were spoken to them were just words of, you know, uh, condemnation. Basically, you know, you, you have 40 days and the city of Nineveh is going to be overthrow, overthrown. That's all he says to them. And if we were to take time to read through the passage, it says, I think, that Jonah, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, he took three days to go through the whole city. And I can imagine him going down every single alley, every single by street, you know, just repeating these five words until every single person in that city heard him, heard these five words. You have 40 days and the will be overthrown. The message was clear, it was to the point. You know, 40 days is all you have. And now everything you know is going to be overthrown. 
just bad news. But yet, the whole city repented. Keep that in the back of your mind as we as we will we'll bring up that thought in the closing. Now, when the Ninevites heard this, this was the reaction. In uh, 3.5, we read the following. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. So the people heard this, these five words. And in them hearing these five words, it was enough for them to proclaim a fast and to believe God and to put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Everybody, not, not a single person uh, was exempt. Everyone from the greatest to the least put on a fast and sackcloth. They proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth. Then the word came even to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Even the king heard the same five words, and he too got off his throne, put aside his robe, put on sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he wasn't worthy to sit on the throne anymore because he knew what was coming. He knew in his own heart that the prophet was right, that these five words spoke against his heart too. And so he takes off his royal robe, puts on sackcloth. You know, I'm not worthy to wear this royal robe the way I've acted. You know, I'm not even worthy to sit upon this throne. I should be sitting on a pile of a heap of ashes. And that's exactly what he did. And the king doesn't stop there with that own personal repentance, but he also makes a decree. He says, you know, if I realize my own mistakes, I want to make, I want to make sure that everybody realizes their mistake. And so he makes a decree. He says, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. So it wasn't only the, the people that were going to uh, to uh, be uh, under this, this uh, time of uh, repentance, was even the, the livestock and the animals were going to be subjected to this. They were, going, they were not to taste anything or to drink water. But let man and beast be covered in sackcloth and cry mightily to, the, to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent? And there's that turning. You know, we talked about how that uh, overturn, how the prophecy of Jonah means overturn too. Let everyone turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. There's that turning, that turning that would eventually happen in this city. And there are also vows and repentance made, just similar to like the men who were on that ship that Jonah was sailing toward Tarshish. Those men, they, they made vows to the Lord, and they repented, and they offered sacrifice. And here is, in the city of Nineveh, the men are doing the same thing. They're making these vows, and they're repenting. Very similar pattern. And then we read, in response to this, God, in verse 10, then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he, was, that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Now let's go to the second uh, block in our study of, of uh, Jonah. And it's these uh, prayers, chapter 2 and chapter 4, are linked by the prayers of Jonah. And that's what links these two chapters. William McDonald's commentary takes chapter 2 and he breaks it up into, or he calls it a, you know, this, this chapter 2, he says, it's a, it's a psalm of praise. It's a te deum. It's a doxology, if you will. He says, you know, the first uh, four verses, verses 2 to 6, are thanksgiving. You know, that's what that, that's there. That's what those verses are, are about. They're thanksgiving to the Lord. Uh, verse um, 7 and 8, it's contrition. You see the contrition of the prophet, you know, in his heart. And verse 9, it's about his rededication. Let's read, let's read uh, chapter 2. I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. He answered me. Out of the belly of Seol, I cried and you heard my voice. Notice that he calls being in the, the belly of the great fish. He compares it to being in hell and to being in Seol. I cried out of Seol. I cried out of, out of the belly of Seol. I cried and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea. And the flood surrounded me. All your billows and, and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The water surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me, weeds wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountain. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. 
and now we switch to the contrition. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayers went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. And finally, here's this rededication. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. What did those uh, men on the ship do? They vowed to the Lord. What did they, the Ninevites do? They, they vowed to the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. And here's the prayer that Jonah offers, offers up in this chapter too. You know, it's a heart full of praise. It's a psalm of praise, as William McDonald calls it. And now this song of praise is going to change its tune when we get to chapter four. The prayer he's going to offer up is not going to be a, 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 a prayer of thanksgiving. It's not going to be a, a psalm of praise. It's actually going to be a, a bit of psalm of criticism, as we'll, we'll come to it in chapter four. We read in chapter four and verse two. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, who relents from doing harm. You know, Jonah actually is quoting from the book of Exodus. And if you go to go back to Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, God is speaking to Moses. And this is what God says about himself to Moses. Exodus chapter 34, verse 67. And the Lord passed before me and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in, God, in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children to the third and fourth generation. But this is what the Lord says about himself. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. It's almost as if the prophet's taking God's own word and throwing them in his face. God, I knew you were gracious and merciful, God. Slow to anger and abundant love and kindness, who relents from doing harm. And that's why I fled to Tarshish, because I knew these things about you, God. I knew that you were merciful. I knew that you were slow to anger. And I knew that you're full of loving kindness. You're abundant in loving kindness. That you relent from doing harm. And that's why I had to go to Tarshish. I didn't want to be part of what you were do, going to do in Nineveh. I didn't want no part of that. And that's why I fled to Tarshish. And the late Robbie Zacharias would say that, uh, that uh, scholars, Hebrew scholars would kind of blush when they read this because the passion coming from the prophet, it almost carries the, the strength of an expletive. The way he's talking to God, there's just the passion coming from the prophet, you know, in the original language. It's just, uh, it's enough to uh, kind of uh, bat an eye at, you know, just the, the passion, that the, the unbridled passion coming from this prophet as he's speaking to God. God, I knew you were these things and that's why I, I went to Tarshish. And as I said, that song of praise that was in chapter two, you know, that prayer of thanksgiving changes his tomb. You know, in, in chapter two, he's happy. Yeah, he says, you have brought my, up my life from the pit, he says. And he's glad that God saved him from, the, from the, the belly of the great fish. But here in chapter four, he's gonna wish death upon himself three times. Uh, verse, verse three of chapter four, therefore now, o Lord, please take my life from me. For it's better for me to die than to live. And that's how upset the prophet is. He says, Lord, please take my life. I don't want to be part of what you're doing here in Nineveh. It's better for me to die than to live. Now, three times he wishes death upon himself. Verse 8. Then he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. And finally, in verse 9. Is it right for me to be angry? Even so to death. Even to death. It is right for me to be angry. Even to death. Three times he, he wishes death upon himself in this chapter. And verse 5, we read, So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. You know, Randy Amos recently went home to be with the Lord. We used to uh, spend some time with him up in Pine Bush Bible Camp uh, during the men's Bible study. And one of the things I remember in his study of God's Word, he told us, you know, you're going to find a pattern in Scripture. And he said, it's not 100%, but you're going to find more often than not that the the direction of east in scripture is often associated with going away from God. You think of different examples. Uh, Adam and Eve were cast east of Eden, and there were cherubim and a sword put so they could not enter. And they were out of God's will because they had 
not believe God and they have partaken of the, the fruit of good the knowledge of good and evil. During the time of uh, Moses, you know, we read about that, that passage in Exodus when the Lord describes himself to Moses. And during that time, um, the Lord brings these plagues upon Egypt. You know, the plague of locusts was actually brought by an east wind, if you read the passage. And so the, the direction of east is always thought of uh, going away from God. And by, and by contrast, the direction west is thought of going towards God. In fact, if you were to look at the, uh, the uh, furniture in the tabernacle and the arrangement, uh, the Holy of Holies is west of the holy place. And so as you're going towards the presence of God, you're going, you're going westward. And we know that because of the arrangement of the furniture, because we're told that the, uh, the table of showbread is on the north. And so by extension, the Holy of Holies would be on the west. And so you're going towards the presence of God in the westerly direction. On the east, you're going to find there's a pattern in scripture that uh, Jonah is an example of that pattern. You know, he sat on the east side of the city. This prophet who had run away to Tarshish, still out of God's will, even though he, he went to the city of Nineveh, he's still not understanding what God is all about. And we talked about how, how he knew that God was merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. You know, he knew that in his head, but he didn't understand what the extent of that was. He didn't understand what that meant for the Ninevites, that God would even extend that loving kindness to them, that mercy and that grace to them. Though he knew this about God, he didn't know the full extent of what that meant. We talked about how Jonah's life was intrinsically tied to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that the ones who get saved in this book are Gentiles. You know, we talked about chapter 1. Those are mariners who were in, in the boat. In chapter uh, of uh, three, it's the Ninevites who get saved. You know, the Gentiles are the ones who are being saved in this book. In like manner, over two thousand years of recorded uh, biblical his or, or history uh, since the, the since the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's been predominantly Gentiles who have come to faith. You know, the Gentiles have been the ones who have answered the, to the gospel message. Though there is a day coming for the Jew. But for the most part, it's been the Gentiles who have been saved. You know, there's that, day, that time of the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ in the life of Jonah. It's almost like it's as if it's a picture of what the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ would be. You know, here's this book about this prophet. And all we read about is Gentiles being saved. You know, and right now, during the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's Gentiles who are predominantly coming to faith. It's not that Jews can't be saved. In fact, there's many Jews who have come to faith. Uh, but uh, one brother said, I think it was uh, Jabe Nichols, who said, the problem with a Jew coming to faith now is that He's not part of the nation of Israel anymore, is he? Because the second he comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what? He's part of the church. And so the church has to go away for the nation of Israel to come to faith in God and to set the Lord Jesus Christ as their savior. Because if they do it now, during this church age, they just become part of the church. But there is a day coming where the whole Jewish nation will recognize the one they crucified as the Messiah they were waiting for. And we look forward to that day. But the church needs to be out of the picture. And then Israel will come, to, will come to faith in God as a nation. Now Jonah, interestingly enough, he wants to die outside the city walls. Remember, he said three times he, he wished for death upon himself. And he's upset because God is merciful and saved the city. He wants to die because God is merciful and he saved the city. Ironically, the Lord Jesus Christ dies outside the city walls of Jerusalem. Why? For the very same reason. God is merciful. And by that, and the act of him dying, he saved us all. See there the difference? Jonah is upset. He wants to die because God is merciful. He wants to die outside the city walls because God is merciful. By the same, by the same token, because God is merciful, the Lord Jesus Christ dies outside the city walls of Jerusalem and saves us by that very act. You know, more was saved after Jonah's quote-unquote resurrection and the Lord Jesus Christ's death and resurrection than before. Uh, you know, we talked about that that passage there in uh, chapter 2 when he's given this praise, this uh, psalm of praise, how he refers to the belly of the whale as a seal. You know, and so in a sense, he's referring to that experience as a deaf experience. And so him coming out of the, the belly of the whale, uh, however glorious that was being uh, uh, upchucked on the on the shore, you know, that's kind of a resurrection for, 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 for Jonah. You know, he came from a place where he was, the belly of the, of the whale, he was in seal, as he calls it, the belly of seal. And he's now given this new new lease on life, 
a second opportunity to do God's will. You know, prior to that, the ones who got saved were just a boat full, just a boat full. But when he went through this death and new life experience, guess what? A whole city full got saved. You know, you compare the, the, the two, you know, as far as the number of people, definitely more people got saved after this experience that, that he went through, right? You know, a boat full versus a city full. And like manna too, the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, he saved many while he walked on earth, you know. You know, he healed people. He, he, he uh, cleansed the leper. You know, he healed the woman with the issue of blood, as we read about this morning. But then he also preached the gospel, and many came to faith. We read about Simon, the, the uh, or, or, well, there was many who came to faith. Uh, Simon Peter was one, of course. He was a fisherman. Uh, and there was uh, Matthew, the tax collector. Many others who uh, we read about came to faith during the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's kind of like a both if you think about it, you know, not to diminish those the things that the Lord Jesus Christ did here on earth. Compared to the many who have been saved since his death and resurrection, and it's, the number is exponentially larger. You know, you think about the 2,000 years that have transpired since then. You know, yeah, many got saved during his lifetime, but much more being saved after his death and resurrection. It's kind of like comparing the both to a city full. You know, it uh, truly is a picture of Jonah's life and mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. The ones who are being saved is much larger after this death and resurrection. There's an interesting question that the uh, disciples asked the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, when they're on this ship that's on the Sea of Galilee and they're on their way to the gatherings. Um, you know, they wake him up and they say to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And that's the question they ask the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, they, they see themselves in the, this ship and um, they see the waves crashing around and the winds, you know, stirring up. And the, their teacher is sleeping. The Lord Jesus Christ is sleeping. And they wake him up and they say, um, don't you care that we're perishing? You know, in the times that we find ourselves in right now, you know, there are many people who are suffering. You know, I lost my father in April to the virus. Um, there's a brother in Chile. Uh, he went to a assembly in La Florida. It's one of the... Uh, the, um, the suburbs of Chile, of Santiago, I should say. And, um, you know, they were praying for him, this brother, uh, David Rosa. And uh, not David Roy, the missionary, but David Rosa. He was a well-known brother. And, um, and he, he, he unfortunately uh, came down with the virus. He was in the hospital and a respirator. And then unfortunately, uh, his body gave out and he, he passed away. As a brother I met in uh, Italy uh, about a year ago and, uh, uh, during the conference, the IBCM conference, uh, his name is actually, actually we, have, we share the same name. Uh, I'm, I'm Alejandro, which is Alexander, and he's Alessandro, which is the Italian of Alexander, Alessandro Esposito. And uh, his father, he, he's been posting a lot of pictures of his father on Facebook, on social media. His father also came down with the, the virus and passed away. You know, we know many in our circles, too, who have lost uh, loved ones. There are many among us who are, you know, without a job. You know, uh, there's a sister I spoke at Ten of Flies, some... Uh, last month, and uh, the couple who took me out for fellowship afterwards, she she asked for prayer for her grandson. You know, her grandson's in high school, and you know their life's been changed a lot too. You know, he he, uh, in fact, he um, he just had a breakdown because um, you know, he was so excited about the coming school year. He's finally, you know, he'd been playing varsity, and it's finally his uh, junior year, and it was time to play. And they 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 had an abbreviated season. And then guess what's uh, they had another outbreak in their high school, and so they had to cancel the season. And he just, uh, you know, just heartbroken about the whole thing, and it just uh, he just couldn't cope anymore. That he just stopped attending school altogether. He just stopped signing on, and, he, and she asked for prayer for him. And this virus and this pandemic has affected us in different ways. Whether it's the loss of a loved one, whether it's the loss of employment, whether it's a breakup in our plans or whatever it is, you know. And we can be asking the same thing to the Lord, Lord, don't you care what's going on around us? Don't you care that we're losing loved ones? Don't you care, Lord, that we're out of work. Lord, don't you care what's going on? And I think the Lord answers that question that the, the disciples ask him on the boat. I think it's answered by what he says in the book of Jonah at the very end. But the Lord said, and should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and much livestock. And then search your own enemy there. And should I not pity South Branch or Hillsborough 
Or should I not pity North America? Or should I not pity this terrestrial ball in which we live on? And all the people who can't discern from their right hand and left hand. Remember the message of Jonah? It was nothing but bad news. Nothing but bad news. But yet, in the bad news, people repented, right? And just maybe the Lord's allowing all these things to happen to us in the times we live in. All this bad news to come to us. Not for our, our sake, but for their sake. And sometimes someone has to get down really low, really low. You know, the mariners, they had to try to exhaust everything at their hand. They had to try to exhaust all their efforts. They had to get try to, you know, everything they tried was failing until finally they turned to the Lord. And I wonder if the Lord's in their love for them, the lost ones out there. He's allowing all these things to happen in the world that we live in. The deaths, the loss of employment, the interruption in our schedules, all these things to happen, all this bad news to happen so they might come into faith in him. And just as it was for the time of, 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 of Jonah, his message was one of bad news, and yet people repented. And maybe too, during this time of bad news, of difficult times, people will come to the Lord. And that's our hope. That the Lord will use these bad moments that we're living in to bring many to him in faith. In closing, let me just say that the book of Jonah is a book full of satire. You know, you have God's man, the prophet rebelling. He's the he's God's man. He's the rebel in this. You know, and that's kind of funny if you think about it. And the, and the sailors, these pagan sailors and the Ninevites, who it's an evil city. I mean, you study history. This city couldn't be any more wicked than, I mean, this is as bad as it comes. And they're the good guys. They're the ones who repent. And the prophet, who's God's man, he's the one that's rebelling. He doesn't want nothing to do with God's plan. You know, he's upset that God's saving these rebels. And there's a little bit of satire in this book. And here's another food for thought as we close. Are you okay with the fact that God loves your enemies? You know, I think about my time in, in college. I remember I had one friend that was, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, he's very wicked. You know, he, he did me some wrong when I was in college. Uh, he was a Muslim young man. You know, and, and in my flesh, you know, I, I, I would love to see that, that that wickedness come back on him. You know, that's just our nature. You know, in fact, uh, I'm not alone in this. Paul, in his, in his, in his I think in his, in his letter to Timothy, he says, Alexander the Cobbler Smith did me much harm. And the Lord repay him. That doesn't sound very Christ-like, does it? That Paul will write there, right? Alexander the Cobbler Smith, he did me much harm. And the Lord repay him. You know, there's something in us, even when we watch our movies, that we want to see the bad guy at the end pay, right? We want to see the good guy triumph and evil, you know, get what it, what it deserves. That, that, that's, that's in our heart that we want to see the, the bad person punished. You know, and I think that I can understand Jonah in that sense. You know, he wanted to see the Ninevites pay for what they had done to Israel. And he wanted God's fury to come down upon them. And I ask you that question again. Are you okay with the fact that God loves your enemies? And yet, aren't you glad that God loves his enemies? I read to you Romans 5, 8 to 10. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. You know, to be honest with you, I don't like the fact that God loves my enemies, but I'm so glad that God loved his enemies. That he loved me when I was still his enemy. And he saved me. And because God loved me and was an enemy, you know what? I think I'm okay with him loving my enemies too. And I hope that's the same for you too. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we uh, draw our time to a close and we think about Jonah and the Lord Jesus Christ, we see these two events, Lord, that are so similar but yet so different. You know how the Lord was in your perfect will, the Lord Jesus Christ, how he did everything that pleased you. And we read about this prophet Jonah, Lord, who had, who had nothing to do with your plan, how he went away down to Tarshish, Lord. And even when he went to the city of Nineveh, he didn't want to see that city saved. And Father, uh, but we're so glad, Lord, that these events, they all foreshadow the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we saw those relationship between Jonah's life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we're so glad, Lord, that the Lord Jesus Christ, because you are a loving God and a merciful God, you went outside the city walls and took his cross, and there bore our sin our sin and shame and died for our, for our sakes. And Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for that sacrifice on our behalf. We want to thank you, Lord, that you are a love, loving God and a merciful God. 
And Lord, as we are thankful for that, Lord, we want to pray for those of you, or those who don't know you. For that's what the Book of Jonah is all about. And that's what the message of Lord Jesus Christ has been all these, these years. He wants to reach those who are lost. And Father, we pray that you would give us words at the right time and right season, Lord. There's many suffering around us because of this pandemic. Many people, Lord, are losing loved ones. Many people, Lord, are suffering unemployment. Many people are having their schedules interrupted, Lord. And Lord, we want to be the bearers of good news in the middle of this of so much bad news. But Father, help us, Lord, to bring the message of the Lord Jesus Christ to those who need them. And Father, we, we, we do pray, Lord, that you would use the, this time that we live, this bad news, to bring many to faith in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray.